So our, our work today is on parametric equations. And um, I'm going to show you what they are before we get into the, the details of what they do. I'm, we're just going to kind of play around with them a little bit. So get yourself your cursor on that first line and type T equals zero. So we're in the Desmos graph or type T equals zero. When you do this, when you define a variable, you have an opportunity to give it a slider and we're going to do that. Um, and so right underneath there, you should see an inequality that, that it starts you out with a couple of blanks. So make your T go from zero to 10. Don't put a step in there, just, just zero to 10. And then call that good. If you hit enter, it should go, should give you a slider that you can actually slide around and, and see the values change. In a minute, we're gonna actually play that. And we don't want it to do a circular loop. So underneath the little play button that comes out there, if you hover over, it says animation properties, click on that and change it to the one that says repeat in one direction. It's got two arrows, both pointing to the right. Click that one and you'll know if you did the right thing, if you hit the play button, it should go from zero to 10 and then it should start back over at zero. As you're doing that, kind of looping through, but it's not kind of going backwards. Uh, all right, go ahead and pause that. Slide it back to zero. Okay, go down to your second line there. We're gonna put a couple of equations in. First one, we're gonna type X1 equals, and it'll turn that one into a little subscript. And let's go X1 equals T. And then hit enter in your, in your third spot, you're gonna do Y1 equals T. And in our last one, we're going to type in the coordinates of a point. So parentheses, it's going to be x1 comma y1. And if you've done everything that I told you, you should end up with a dot at the origin. All right, if you don't have that dot at the origin, then look off of a neighbor, see if you can figure out what's going wrong there. Anybody have any trouble? You got it. All right, go ahead and hit the play button. That thought's going to move. All right, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you can figure out what's going on here. Have a look at those equations. See if you can figure out what's going on. You want to try and describe it, Matthew? So T is a, it's, I don't know what you'd call it a function of terms, but it's oscillating between zero and then repeating back down the loop, mm -hmm. back down to zero. And then, x the x direction you say x1 is equal to t so whatever value t is x the x will be equal to two at whatever time and then y is the same whatever y is equal to t is oscillating and so then they both want to create a point okay and it's moving diagonally because why Ooh, you're thinking of it as a vector? Is it moving in one direction, moving in a straight line? That's cool, I like that. What do you think? Is it a projection? How do you mean? Project the X onto Y or Y onto X. Ah, you could think of it that way. Any other thoughts? All right, um, what would happen? Go ahead and hit pause. And actually let's, Make your slider go so that uh, T is four. See if you can get it right on four. It's kind of tricky to do that. And note the position of the of the point there. So if it's right, if you make T to be equal to four, notice that the point comes up to be at four comma four. Is that surprising to you? No, because we, we define the coordinates of that point to be the X equation and the Y equation, and they're both equal to T, right? So if T is equal to four, 
that makes x equal to four and y equal to four. So we should end up with the point four comma four. Um, what do you suppose is going to happen if, so we're still paused, right? I don't want anybody to hit play until I tell them to. What do you suppose is going to happen if I make x equal to two, x one equal to two? Change it, but don't hit play yet. No spoilers here. If x1 is equal to 2, how is the motion of that point going to change when we do hit play? Anybody want to make a conjecture? Ooh, I'm seeing some some pointing. What do you think, Justin? Uh, it stay, at, stay at, how do you mean it would stay at 2? OK, so the x value is going to stay 2, but the y value is going to go up. So what direction is the point going to be moving this time? So instead of diagonal, it's going to be going straight up. Hit play and see if you're correct. Huh. Cool. All right, what else could we mess around with here? Leave the x equal to 2. Go ahead and pause it again. Let's go ahead and move the slider for t back down to 0. Leave x1 equal to 2. Go to y1 and change it to 4 sine parentheses t, 4 sine t. Without hitting the play button, I'd like you to make a conjecture about what's going to happen with our motion this time. What do you think is going to happen? Is it going to be moving left to right at all? How do we know it's not going to move left to right at all? X is X is fixed. X is going to be two, right? So the point is the point moves. The X value is always going to be two, but the Y value is going to change, right? What's the Y value going to do? Think about sine. What What do you think, Matthew? So we're, we're identifying four as the amplitude. So you're thinking of this as a, as a sine function. Usually this would be an X, but it's a T now. So four is the amplitude. Matthew wasn't hundred percent sure. He said zero to four or negative four to four. How's it gonna, how's it gonna go? What do you think? Zero to four or negative four to four? Negative four to four? Let's try it, hit play and see what happens. Interesting. All right. All right, I got a challenge for you guys. I would like our point to move in a circular pattern. See if you can make that happen for me. I want it to go in a circle. Mess around with your equations. See if you can give me a set of equations that would cause this point to move in a circle. If you figure it out, let me know. Um, I'm going to put up here the most common way that I saw as I was walking. There are a couple different ways to do this, but I saw this on a lot of people's equations. So now it's moving in a circle. So someone make a connection here between this and maybe something that we've been talking about. I don't know, since the beginning of the semester. What do you think? Is it kind of like the unit circle? If, it, if if That's a solid guess. Anytime I ask you to make a connection in the second, second semester, like there's a pretty good chance that I'm trying to get you to take it back this unit circle. It absolutely is, yeah. Right, because sine and cosine give us the X and Y coordinates around the edge of the, the unit circle. And then what's that four doing to it? What's the four doing to it? If we think about it in vectors, the four is kind of making the the kind of the vector bigger, the radius bigger. So it's no longer going the unit circle, it's going into a radius of four instead of one. What else? So if we made that four into one, then we would be looking at, yeah, the unit circle. 
And and we could adjust the values on T so that it wasn't going up to 10. We could make it go from zero to like 6.28 would be about two pi, right? All right, so I'm, I'm curious if you guys can come up with some other wacky uh, motion. So, so let's take just a couple of minutes, play around with your equations for um, X1 and Y1. See if you can see if you can get your point to do any any kind of crazy stuff. Um, some examples would be to like, if you wanted to make it go in one direction faster than the other. Look at that. Mess around, see if you can get some weird motions going. Maybe try using some different functions other than sines and cosines. If you make something interesting, let me know so we can show it to the class. We're just gonna mess around with these equations for just a few minutes here. Okay, so the idea of what we're doing today is it's called parametric equations. And, and what you guys are building right now, what you're playing around with, these are parametric equations. So a parametric equation, instead of what we're used to for a function where we write an equation, it says y equals, and the equation's got a bunch of x's in it. Parametric equation's actually gonna have two equations, gonna have x and y, and the equations will be written in terms of t. t is called the parameter. Typically, t is gonna represent time. So we're looking at not just an equation that sort of gives us a, 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 a um, position of an object, but it, this will show us the path of an object over time. So we're gonna dig into this with our calculators here. So go ahead and get your graphing calculators. Uh, you can go ahead and put away your um, computers at this point. We don't need those for right now. We can play with them a little bit more at the end of the period, but let's switch over to our calculators for right now. And, and let's make sure you guys are comfortable with how to do this on the calculator too because that's the tool that you'll have available to you when we eventually get to our test. All right, let's get those laptops put away. Calculators out, please. You can just close your lid. It'll, it'll keep your equation for you so you can play around with it more later on. And then we're going to be switching to some notes here pretty shortly as well. So if you want to go ahead and get your notebooks out. Okay, I'm going to show you some setting stuff on the calculator. So again, if you could please get those laptops put away, your calculator's out and ready to go. If you missed this setting stuff at the beginning, then you're not going to be able to do anything that I show you how to do afterwards. So let's get going here, folks. On your calculator, go ahead and hit your mode button. And we have not done anything in this mode yet, but we're gonna switch from function mode to parametric mode. Function to parametric mode. Let's step on the gas here, guys. Calculator's out. If you miss this beginning stuff, then you're gonna have a really hard time here in a minute. So put your, put your calculator in parametric mode. If you've got the newer calculator, um, Matthew, you'll be looking for something that has function parametric and polar, and it has to do with the graphing. So it might be in your graph settings instead. So we should be in parametric mode. And then go ahead and hit the Y equals button. And when you do this, you'll see that we no longer have Y1, Y2, Y3. We've got X1, X1, Y1, X2, Y2, X3, Y3. Did you find yours? Yeah, that's probably it. That's probably it. Yes, absolutely. You should have polar, polar is, is that an option too? We'll be doing that in a couple of lessons. If not, don't worry about it, we'll find it then. Yeah, yeah, that's that's polar. So go ahead and switch yours into parametric mode. You should see when you where you put normally put your equations in now instead of y1, y2, we've got x1, y2, x1, y1, x2, y2. Um, let's go ahead and graph a circle. Let's go. Um, I don't know. Let's do. Let's do five cosine t 
for the X coordinate. And by the way, where do you suppose we're going to find the T? Yeah, it's the same button that we've been using for X all along. You ever wonder why that button has an X and a T and a theta and an N? Because you use it for all of those things. So the X is for function mode, T is for parametric, theta is for polar mode, which we'll use uh, later on this week, N is for sequence mode, which we're not going to use. Um, but go ahead and use that button for T. You can also do alpha T. Five cosine T, and for the Y, what do you suppose we're going to put for the Y? Five sine T. Now, before you hit graph, we need to do some other settings. Okay, let me just tell you this now, this because some of you are gonna run into this at some point. By the way, this is a really fun prank to play on people who don't know how to use their calculators as well. Um, at some point, someone's gonna get stuck where they're graphing an animation and it's just gonna keep going and going and going and going. You, do you guys know how to stop your calculator from graphing? Like when you make a mistake and you and you need to stop it, the on button will interrupt it if you do end up graphing it and you need to stop it. So um, just keep that in mind. The on button will interrupt um, and allow you to, to go back and make changes. Before you go on though, go ahead and move your cursor over to the left of the X1. And if you hit enter, you should be able to cycle through some different options. So there's like a thin line, there's a thicker line, there's a bubble with a line coming out of it, there's just a bubble without a line coming out of it, dash line, you got all kinds of options. I'm, I would like you to change yours. Look for the one that's got a bubble with the line coming out of it, which is not this one. I'm not sure if yours is gonna have that. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Okay. What this is going to do is it's going to graph. In, when we did it in Desmos, it just graphed a point. This is going to graph the point, but it's going to also graph the trail behind it so we can kind of see where its path went. All right. And, and then last thing, hit zoom. Six. And it should go ahead and graph your circle. And you should see that point moving in one complete circle. Is that what you saw? Is anyone even bothered the, by the fact that that does not look like a circle? Is that bugging anybody? It's kind of bothering me. It looks more like an ellipse than a circle. Why would that be? Do you guys know why that's the case? Yeah, yeah. The windows. Your screen is wider than it is tall, but the student standard zoom is going to go from negative 10 to 10 in the X and in the Y direction. So, so you're squeezing 10 units, well, 20 units in the Y direction, um, which you don't have as much space. So it's got to squish it down. There's a fix for this happily. If you go back to zoom and choose zoom five, which is zoom square, it will take the window that you're currently in and try and square it out so that things are equal in both the X and the Y direction. And then you should see a nice circle, which is, that feels much better to me. All right. Let's do one more thing. Go into your uh, window button, go into your window menu. Notice that we now have some new information in here. There's a T min, a T max and a T step. Right now, your T max is set to 6.2831853. What, what, what does that make you think of, 6.28? That is 2 pi. That is 2 pi, because I don't know why it chose to do it that way. Is anybody's going from 0 to 360 instead of that? I want to wonder why yours is going 0 to 360 instead. Probably because you're in degree mode. Could you go ahead and change yours to radian mode? And then you're going to have to do zoom standard and then zoom square again to make it happen to make this work. So go to your mode and change it into radian mode and then go zoom six. And then interrupt it and do zoom five to square it out. And then when you go back to your window, you should see it going from zero to two pi instead. Go back to you in your window settings. I'll show you how to do the fun prank, all right? 
where it says T min, leave that as zero. Where it says T max, make that a thousand. <laughs> and then graph it. What's it going to do? It's going to spin around in a circle a whole bunch of times, right? Up to a thousand. So every 6.28, that's one full circle. How many of those are you going to fit in a thousand? A whole bunch. Now, if somebody didn't know the trick how to interrupt this, this would be really frustrating because now they're stuck watching this on their calculator go round and round in circles. There's nothing they can do. You can try pushing buttons. The only button that does anything will be the on button, right? So, but you guys know the trick. So hit the on button and interrupt it. And then you can go back into your, let's go back into our window button. Let's make it something more reasonable. Let's make it 10. I'm going to make my T-step, I don't know, what should we have our T-step? If we wanted to slow it down a little bit, if I wanted this to go a little slower, give me a value I could put in here to make it go a little bit slower. Let's go 0.05. I like that. 0.05. That'll make it go roughly half as fast. Yep. So sometimes when you're watching these, you want to put it down into ultra slow motion mode and you can just adjust the T step and that'll slow it down. I don't want to watch this go all the way around for another half time. So I'm going to interrupt it. All right. So to get this into that mode, we need to be in parametric mode. We're going to have to adjust. And when we do our window, we're going to have to adjust not just our X and Y values, but we're also going to need to be talking, thinking about um, where does T start, where does T end, and how fast do we want T to be updating? All right. Okay, let's take some notes. Were you able to figure out how to do all your stuff on there? Okay. We'll be all right. Okay, so parametric equations. Like I said, instead of Y being defined in terms of X, now we have X and Y both being defined in terms of T and T is called the parameter. This is the most common use for parametric equations. This has a lot of applications in physics, um, engineering. Who's taken physics or is taking physics now? So have you guys done projectile motion where you have, so you've got an X equation and a Y equation. So you've done this already. These are, those are parametric equations. Your X equation was probably a linear equation and then your Y equation was a quadratic and it maybe had a sine or a cosine if you were shooting something at an angle. Yeah, what is it? Y sine, yeah. So um, yeah. Oh, that's where you, that's where Y sine came. Okay, gotcha. And your X had the cosine in it. Let's, yeah, we'll be, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so you're, you're familiar with the basic idea of it. So we're going to do a kind of a physics -y type of problem. This is not going to be an exactly, this is, this one's, if those of you who have taken physics will recognize this is not happening on earth because it doesn't have that 16 in it. Did you guys use 16 or did you use 4.9 in your equations for projectiles? Did you do feet per second or meters per second? And meters. meters per second. So you use 9.8 meters per second squared yeah. for gravity. Yeah. So in, in, in feet per second squared, it's 32. Anyways, this one is the gravity here would be two meters per second, which is not, <laughs> it's not negligible, but it's much smaller than on Earth. So this might be a package being dropped on Venus or something. I don't know. I don't know what Venus's gravity is. I know Mars is less than Earth. Venus is more than, is Venus bigger than Earth? Gravity, gravity is linked to the mass. Gravity is, gravity is linked to mass. There is some centripetal force, but it's pretty negligible compared to, to gravity. Okay. 
All right, so the situation here is we got a delivery drone on Mars or Venus or some, some other planet or moon, and it's gonna deliver a package and it's, and it's coming in hot, right? It's not just gonna stop and drop it. It's gonna, it's gonna drop it mid flight. So this package is gonna kind of, kind of, if you think about what would happen if you were like moving and you dropped something, can you trace out what that would look like with your hand? It would kind of, yeah, it would kind of, yeah, so if I were looking at this, it was flying along and it dropped something, it's gonna kind of curve down and hit the ground. Kind of like half of a parabola is what I'm expecting to see here. So we're gonna do this by hand first and then we'll go look at what it looks like on the on the calculator. Um, I'll tell you, this stuff's pretty easy to do. Um, the harder part comes when you're analyzing it later on. And those of you who've taken physics will probably have a little bit easier time with that. Um, I want us to tabulate some points. We're gonna do from zero to four. When we make these tables now though, you're used to from algebra one making T tables, we're gonna make pi tables now because we don't just have two columns. We got three, three columns. You see why it's a pi table? It kind of looks like a pi. T, X, and Y. And they said specifically zero to four. So we'll go zero, one, two, three, four here. And if I asked you to do this by hand on a or a test where you didn't have a calculator, how do you suppose you'd figure out the values in the X column? <laughs> yeah, X equation tells us to find the X values, you take whatever the T is and multiply it by two. Right, that's what the equation is telling us to do with t. So we'll do that. Zero times two is zero. One times two is two. Two times two. Three times two. Four times two. And to find our y values, we will take the t values and do what with them? We'll square them and then subtract whatever we get from eight. I make this mistake, I've made this mistake a lot of times. So when I do this, I always cover up my X column because I will end up taking the X values and plugging them into this equation instead of the T values. You see where that could be pretty easy to do? So because I've made that mistake, I come up with that solution. So I can't even see the X values. Okay, T values, eight minus zero squared, it's eight. Eight minus one squared, seven. Eight minus two squared, eight minus three squared, eight minus four squared is negative, sorry, negative eight, I think. Does that look great? We're gonna graph these in a minute, but before we do, I wanna I wanna talk about a couple questions. So question number one. When did it hit the ground? I want you focusing just on the table. Imagine we don't know what the equations are. We just have that table in front of us. And I ask you, when did it hit the ground? Now, when I say when, is that which column are we thinking? Which column should we be looking at for when? Our answer is gonna come out of the T column, but we need to be looking at one of the other columns to talk about hitting the ground. What's gonna tell us that it hits? What column is gonna tell us that it has hit the ground, the Y column. We're looking for when Y is equal to what? Zero. So we're basically looking for the T when Y is equal to zero. So we don't have a value in our Y column where it's equal to zero, but we can see that's gonna happen somewhere between this four and this negative one. So if you had to make an estimate of when it's gonna happen, I'd say what? Between two and three seconds, for sure. Between two and three seconds. 
So we could say between two and three. What if I change that question to where did it hit the ground? Where did it hit the ground? So we're not looking at the T column anymore. Did it hit the ground right underneath where it was dropped? Right underneath where it was dropped would have been, well, it was dropped at zero seconds. So right underneath where it was dropped, that would be when X is equal to zero. So how far did it travel from, if you were to be sitting on, if you're sitting on the, on the ground right underneath the drone at the moment that that package dropped off of it, how far away was the package when it finally hit the ground? So we know it hit the ground somewhere between two and three seconds, right? So how far away from you was it somewhere between two and three seconds? I'd say some, somewhere between four and six, let's say it's meters away from you. So I'd say for my answer for this, between four and six meters from a point directly beneath where it was originally dropped. We'll come up with some better answers than that in just a second. Let's go ahead and graph this thing. Um, we're gonna be graphing X and Y. It looks like everything is positive in the X direction. I don't think I'm going to graph this last point because it seems kind of meaningless, doesn't it? Eight meters, negative eight meters, that would be underground, right? That doesn't really seem like it's it's applicable. So I think if I make myself a graph that's got eight, at least eight units going positive and at least eight units going horizontal in the X direction, we should be good. So I'm graphing X versus Y here y versus x, I guess. And then just focus on these two columns and graph those points, 0, 0,8, 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, 2, 7, 4, 4, 6, negative 1. There's something else that we should probably add to this graph aside from just the points and the curve that connects them. Because remember, parametric equations contain more information than just the location of the thing. It's really giving you like a movie about what's happening to the thing. So it's not just the location that this package was, but also a direction that was traveling. So I like to put arrowheads to indicate how it was moving in between those points. It started up at the top. and it moved in that that direction down the curve. I think we got to graph this in our calculators, see what it looks like. So we've got our equations up here. Let's go ahead and see what we're looking like here. Looking at my X, X and Y, that should be plenty. So two T. I'm going to check my window to see, do I really need it to go from zero to 10 seconds? And eh, not really. 
I could have it go from zero to four seconds. That would be plenty. Let's graph it and see what it looks like. You know, I never tried this before. You want to do a little experiment? If I wanted to know where it hit the ground, I would be looking for this x-intercept here, right? In function mode, our calculator is able to find x-intercepts. I don't know if it works in parametric mode. Do you know how to remember how to find x-intercepts in function mode? It was under the calculate menu under second trace. Well, let's let's give it a try. I don't know. Oh no, it doesn't. Bummer. It does have value. What do you suppose value is going to do? It's kind of like trace. Yeah. So if you try value, it actually asks you for a value of t. That's interesting. So when you do second calc value. You're gonna, it's gonna ask you for a value of T. If you type in three, what do you suppose the calculator is gonna spit out at you? It's probably gonna give, I'm hoping it's gonna give me six and negative one. That'd be awesome. Oh, look, it does. Look at that. Oh, that's so smart, these calculators. Cool. Okay. Interesting. What else does it do in here? DY DX, huh? And DY DT and DX DT. Keep this in mind for next year for calculus. Those last three might be useful to you in calculus. Okay, um, let's see if we can get ourselves a better answer than between two and three seconds for when does it hit the ground. What would be a, a, a way that we could figure out exactly two point something, like something rounded to the nearest hundredth place? We could guess and check with the calculator. That sounds a little tedious though. We could solve for it. Which equation will be, we, would we be using if we were going to solve for when did it hit the ground? Are we going to be solving the equation with x and t or the one with y and t? We'll solve for the equation with y and t. That equation is y equals 8 minus t squared. And if we're going to solve that, that must mean there's some value that we can substitute in place of either the y or the t. What specific value are we looking at here? We want the y to equal zero. So let's plug zero in for y. And let's solve that equation. I'm getting root eight. I'm gonna go ahead and type that in my calculator. I'm hoping it comes up between two and three because that's what we figured out from the table. About 2.83 seconds. Now, theoretically, it should be a plus or minus because we're taking the square root of t squared. But we can eliminate negative, negative, right? That doesn't make sense in this context. So it would just be positive. So about 2.83 seconds. Why doesn't it go to the So if we think about so the question is why why will we not in, um, include the negative? If we're talking about values of t, a negative value of t would be before what? What happened at zero? the package was dropped at zero. So, so if we start going into the negative values, that package is still gonna be on the drone, right? So these equations don't really relate to it because the package is still on the drone at that point. There must be a different set of parametric equations that would govern its position at that point. Um, how could we then come up with a better answer than between four and six meters from directly below where it was dropped. Which equation will we be using this time?
we were looking at the x column of the table before, so I think we should be looking at the x equation, right? And x is equal to 2t. So this time I'd be using the x equals 2t equation. And if we're going to solve that equation, we're going to need a value for x, or we're going to need a value for t. Good idea? Yeah, let's go ahead and take this, this value that we got for t here, and let's pop it in there for t. So we would end up getting about, what's that come out to be? 5.66 meters from a point directly below, I don't know where it was dropped. All right, so when it comes, for, for me anyways, when it comes to parametric equations, a lot of what you're gonna be doing is, is just graphing, tabulating. And that's the kind of easy part of parametric equations. The trickier part is when you're actually dealing with the situation and they start asking you questions about it. Knowing where do I look in my table to come up with an answer to that question? Where, which equation would I be solving to answer that equa that question and what number am I? Working on my graph to solve that equation. So, um, and we'll mess around with that. I'm sure you guys are gonna have some questions from our homework, do the best you can with that. There's one more piece that I wanna talk about today and then we'll be done with our notes. This is a pretty late day in terms of notes. So should be giving you guys a good chunk of time for starting the assignment. You guys had no homework all last week, so I'm going to make it up to you this week. It's going to be awesome. You can have huge homework assignments. It's it's not actually true. This is this it really isn't. It's it may seem like a lot just because you haven't had any for a while, but it's not. Um, I'm just rewriting my same two equations because I'm going to use this same since we've been messing around with this parametric system. Um, I'm gonna use the same system for this last part. So oftentimes you end up with a parametric system of equations and it's useful to turn that back into an equation, a single equation that just involves X and Y. Okay, and this, what this is called is eliminating the parameter. And I think we did something a lot like this in first semester. Maybe we'll do an example and I'll see if this looks familiar to you. This is a two-step process. Step one, isolate, which means solve for T in one equation. and then substitute that into the other. I'm, tr I'm trying to remember as well, Our, my class on Friday was like, we like, no, we did this. I'd have to go back and look. Yeah, I'm, I think so too. Composite functions and that kind of stuff. Functions inside of functions. 
Yeah. Oh, maybe it's just D of X. Like yeah, this for... yeah, I don't know, but oh, yeah, this this will look familiar, anyways. So, so the nice thing is that you give your choice for this step one, and you want to you want to cho choose to make your life easy on step one. If you had to pick one of these equations to get t by itself, which one looks easier to you? The first one looks way easier to me. Does it look easier to you guys too? Yes, that's a one stepper. So. For, for step one, I would probably choose the first equation, x equals 2t, and I do a little bit of work to it, and I don't normally, I wouldn't normally show these steps, but since this is our notes, we'll go ahead and show that I would divide by two on both sides to get t by itself. And then that is going to go into our other equation. So our other equation was y equals eight minus t squared. We just need to take what we just got for t, that x over two, and substitute that in for t and the other equation. And now we should have an equation just in terms of x's and y's. Clean that up a little bit. We want that y equals eight minus x squared over four. Hey, use your algebra two skills for me. What uh, what kind of equation are we looking at there? It's got x squared in it. What do we call equations that have x squares? Yeah. Quadratic equations. Quadratic equations would have, have what kind of graphs? Par parabolic. So it's going to have a the graph that's going to be a parabola. Is it going to be opening upwards or downwards? Yeah. Opening downwards. What's the y-intercept going to be? If you plug 0 in for x, what are you going to get for y? 8. So you're going to have a parabola opening downwards with a y-intercept of 8. Um, look at the graph that you drew just a minute for your parametric equation. Does that kind of resemble what you're going to look? It's going to be the same thing, isn't it? Um, go back to your calculators now and let's graph this. Now, this is a function. It's not a parametric anymore, so we're going to need to switch our mode back to function mode. So go back into mode. Let's go ahead and switch back into function mode. It doesn't matter if we're using radians or degrees because we don't have any sines or cosines or tangents here. Go into y equals and go ahead and type that equation in eight minus x squared over four. And then we'll graph it and we should see the exact same graph that we were looking at a minute ago, kind of, but not exactly. Because we've lost some information. What, what information gets lost when we do this? What are we losing? Yeah, we didn't, we, we lost a starting point and what else? Yeah, we lost the direction that it's traveling. All we know is that the, the package is going to travel somewhere along some portion of this path. But I don't know where it's going to start and where it's going to end, how fast it's going to be moving along that path. So, um, so it's useful sometimes to do this so that you can think, talk about the path that it takes. But when you do this, you lose all the motion information. All right. So that's it. You guys like some time to start on your super huge assignments? Yeah. It's going to be awesome. You will definitely want your calculators for this. Yes. This will be our 6.3 assignments. Page 530, we're going to do one to four all, <laughs> and five to 25 odd. <laughs> oh, it's not that bad. Like like so, so 
So I'm going to put them up on the board here, and I want to talk you through what you're actually going to do on these. Let me go through, and I'll show you what you're going to do, and then and you'll know the answer to that. All right, so have a look with me here, please. Hey, guys, please. Um, pay attention here, because it's going to save you some work, because some of these you don't have to do nearly as much work as others. One through four, all you need to do is take the equations they give you, type them in your calculator, and match them up to the graphs. They also want you to tell what you think the graphing window is. So if you type it in and you have to, you're going to want to rest around with your window to see what, what the graphing window is. So for this one, I have, I'm pretty sure this is negative five to five in the X direction and um, negative five to five also in the Y direction. So your, your answer, I don't know if it's going to be one, two, three, or four, but whatever one it is, is going to say that matches up with A and the window is negative five to five in the x direction and negative five to five in the y direction okay i don't i i honestly don't know looking at the equations which one that's going to be um i'll let you play around with it all right uh when you get to number five five's kind of a uh, singleton they're going to give you two equations. They're going to give you a table, and you're just going to find the table and then make a graph of it. So very similar to what we did today. Now, make some notes on this for seven and nine, please, because this is going to save you some time. OK, seven and nine. You are going to graph and make a table for this, but. but you're only going to make a table for the portion of it that's, that it tells you in seven and nine. You're using the same two equations for seven and nine, but you're only going to tabulate the portion of T that it tells you in seven and nine. Does that make sense? So they told they give you two equations for both of them. One is three minus T squared for X and one is two T for Y. What I recommend to save yourself some time is actually graph this in your calculator first to get an idea what it looks like. And that's going to tell you what you need to do here. So I'll tell you for number seven, if you go from zero to 10, you're going to end up with some massive values for your X. If you think about it, what are you going to get if you plug 10 in for, for T here? You're going to end up with three minus 100. You're going to end up with negative 97. Are you really going to graph that? No, no. I don't need you to graph all that. So I'd say if it goes out from out of your, your standard window from negative 10 to 10, don't graph that point. So, so for this, you don't need to graph those ones, but, but graph something that's reasonable. So graph the portion of this that's reasonable. You'll, you'll be able to see that better when you actually graph it in your calculator first. So again, my hint for seven and nine is graph these in your calculator first. Get an idea of what the thing's going to look like and what values of X are going to be appropriate for you to actually graph. Um, for number nine, spoiler alert, you're going to graph negative three to three. You'll graph negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. Okay, you'll make a table with seven seven things in it. But for number seven, you're not going to need to graph all the way from zero to 10 because it goes way off at some point. OK. Um, and then 11 through 25 is just practicing what we did just a minute ago, where you eliminate the parameter. So those ones are those ones are fairly straightforward. When it says to identify the graph of the parametric curve, I want you to do the best to to say what type of graph are you going to get? Are you going to get an absolute value graph? Are you going to get a parabola? Are you going to get a cubic graph? Are you going to end up with a sine or a cosine? Is it going to be now? You may have to dig back a little bit, but did you guys do graphs of circles last year? Do you know what graphs of circles and ellipses look like? X squared plus y squared equals r squared. Yeah. Did you all do that last year? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, do the best you can on identify. At least the big thing is going to be eliminate the parameter, and then we'll talk about identifying them together. Okay. 
So it's not as nearly as massive an assignment as it might look like. Go ahead and get started on it. Um, you should be able to finish up probably a good chunk of it here. Um, while you're doing that, I do need to check your 6.2 homework. I don't think I ever did that. 